No, my name's Christian Robsek with Service First Restoration, and I'm here with Vin from EnviroCheck, and we can't thank you enough for coming today to allow us to bring more education to you guys as it relates to uh, asbestos testing and rules and regulation and abatement. And uh, we have our, uh, EnviroCheck is one of our service providers, is, is our go-to service provider when it comes to environmental testing. We also have P.W. Stevens in the room who handles our asbestos abatement. Um, you have little cards in front of you that says something about having a question, a little four by four card. Uh, you also have a raffle ticket. Uh, we will be doing a raffle at the end, uh, but any questions you have, uh, if you please write them down on the piece of paper, and then uh, Ryan from my team will come by uh, towards the end and we'll gather them, and then we'll have a Q&A uh, uh, Q at the end of the video, or at the end of the presentation. Um, Service First Restoration, give me the 30 second on who we are and what we're about. We're a Class B general contractor. We also carry a C36 plumbing license. We specialize in water mold and fire cleanup. Um, our competitive advantage is our commitment to five-star service. What five-star service to us means, it's pretty simple. Not everybody executes it, but it's pretty simple. It's proactive communication. So knowing what's going on with your jobs at, at all times. We utilize technology to help uh, connect that uh, between our customers and ourselves. Uh, also, fair and ethical billing practices. Uh, the one reason why I like getting into this industry because there was a lot of companies that don't have fair and ethical billing practices and allows you when you treat people fairly and do a good job to, to stand out. And so just th can't thank you enough for coming and I'm gonna turn it over to Van to, to teach us about everything he knows about asbestos and Rule 1403 and AQMD. And we have uh, re represented, we have uh, homeowners association uh, managers and, and, and board members and property owners. We have people in the multifamily space. And so, um, look forward to a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. All right. Uh, before we get started, I've got a, a short little video I like to start off uh, a lot of my presentations with. It usually uh, sets the asbestos mood. <laughs> <laughs> Smart woman. She's putting a new floor down by herself. Wise woman. She's using Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. She can even put Kentile Vinyl Asbestos directly over old linoleum. All she needs is a brush, scissors, and Kentile brush-on adhesive. Result? A beautiful playroom like this. A kitchen like this. Or a bedroom like this. With Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile, you get a choice of all the newest sparkling metallic colors, tones and shades to match any decor. And best of all, you get a floor that's greaseproof, long-lasting, easiest to keep clean. Ask your dealer to show you the famous Kentile Guarantee. Kentile Vinyl Asbestos Tile. The economical buy in vinyl tile. There we go. So, how many of you in the room, by show of hand, have dealt with asbestos and dealt with asbestos issues, abatement, testing, and all that stuff. So everybody's kind of had some experience. Okay, great, good. So uh, today I think uh, you'll, you'll learn a lot besides what you've already know already. And um, um, you know, if you have questions, feel free to, to jot them down. I don't think there are any dumb questions when it comes to asbestos, for sure. Um, quick shameless plug about who I am and where I work. Again, my name is Vin Pham. I'm a certified asbestos consultant. Um, I've been with EnviroCheck. This is now my 20th year with EnviroCheck. As much as you, you don't believe it, but yeah. I, um, we have, a, I work out of the corporate office in Orange. Uh, we have offices up and down California. And one of our unique things uh, about EnviroCheck is we have our own laboratory. So we process a lot of our own samples out of our own laboratory, okay? Who knows what asbestos is? Everybody always, I deal with asbestos all the time, but what is asbestos? It's fire retardant. It's, it's a fiber, okay? It, it comes from a mineral rock is what it is. It, it, it gets mined out of the ground. It's actually a naturally occurring product. It happens to be our state rock, serpentine. California state rock is serpentine. That's a form of asbestos. So asbestos is a fiber. It's mined, it's processed. And it was an additive that was added to construction materials. Um, asbestos was actually, the discovery of asbestos goes back to the Greek days. And they realized that asbestos had a lot of unique qualities. Uh, asbestos doesn't burn. It's acid proof. 
Um, it's a great lubricator. It's a great insulator. So in the 40s is when they first started using asbestos in construction materials and roofing materials. And then in the 70s, 60s and 70s, you know, it was used in a lot of construction materials because it, it was great. It added tensile strength. So vinyl asbestos tile, when you mix asbestos fibers into the, to the tile, it made the tile super resilient, hard. It lasted a long time. It was a great product. Um, they used it in popcorn spray, right, the popcorn ceiling. And the reason why they mixed asbestos into the popcorn or the acoustic spray was it was a lubricant. It lubricated the, the gun, so it's a sprayed on material. So when you added asbestos into this wet, goopy material that you spray on the ceilings, the asbestos fibers would pull the, the material and the, out and it sprayed it nice and even onto the ceiling. So that's why they used it asbestos in the popcorn ceiling. So, um, and it was used heavily in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. <coughs> now, one of the myths that I get a lot with asbestos is, you know, my building was built in 1980. There's no asbestos. There's no way there's asbestos. Built in 82. No way there's asbestos. We're not going to test. And that's a myth uh, because a lot of people believe that 1978 is the cutoff for asbestos. And that's simply not true at all. Uh, in 1978, the truth is, is that the EPA and the federal government went to the manufacturers of decorative sprays. Once they kind of found out asbestos causes <coughs> cancer and lung issues, the EPA went to the manufacturers of the uh, sprayed on people, people, people uh, contra I mean, manufacturers that made sprayed on applications said, okay, from now on, do not make any new stuff that contains asbestos. But anything that they already had, they already sold, contractors already had possession of, was still being installed up until the early 80s. So that's why there is really no cutoff date with asbestos. In addition to that, um, you know, a lot of these companies fought back to the EPA and said, you know, hey, uh, kind of like the tobacco industry fought back and said, you know, show me proof that our products cause all these health problems, you know, because they wanted to ban asbestos in the, in the late 90s, late 80s, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, so a, a lot of the, the ban got overturned. So there's still a lot of asbestos products that are being used today, particularly in roofing. You can go to Home Depot and buy yourself some Henry's Roof Patch Mastic, and that still has asbestos today. So and there's other products that can still have asbestos, as well as, you know, products being imported here. Floor tiles and, and, and drywall sometimes can have asbestos. Um, you know, I think back when Hurricane Katrina, there was a shortage of, of drywall, and a lot of drywall <coughs> got shipped over from China, and they said that some of that could have asbestos in it. So, love to bang China on everything, you know, but, uh, you know, it could happen, right? So, there is no real cutoff date with asbestos. Now, couple, next couple of slides, I'm going to go through and just show you some common products in a residential building that could have asbestos in it, okay? Um, we talked about decorative sprays, so popcorn ceiling, fireproofing, textured ceilings, very common to have asbestos in it, okay? You've probably seen these materials before, also called popcorn uh, ceiling or cottage cheese ceiling. Uh, drywall mud and joint compounds. So this is very common to have asbestos as well. So asbestos is usually in the joint compound. So you know, with drywall construction, you've got drywall sheets that are screwed onto the framing. And at the seams and the corners, that's where it's taped and mudded. And that material typically has the asbestos in it. Not in the drywall sheets itself, but in the joint compound. Common to have asbestos, very common. Plaster, interior plaster. Uh, exterior stucco, common to have asbestos as well, okay? Uh, like that video, floor tiles. So anytime you see those little nine by nine floor tiles, usually underneath carpets in older homes, very common to have asbestos in it. Even the 12 by 12s can have asbestos in it. Underneath those tiles, there's an adhesive, we call it mastic. It's a black tar adhesive. That material can have asbestos in it as well. Um, old linoleum, old uh, vinyl floors can have asbestos. You usually see those in kitchens and bathrooms and laundry rooms, okay? Um, thermal system insulation, so ductwork. 
So in a residential home, you usually will see, in the older homes, you usually will see two types of ductwork that's original that could have asbestos in it. One of them is called a lumabestus, where the actual tube or the duct is made of rolled paper. And that paper is essentially asbestos paper. And it was actually a brand name there. Uh, you can see that top photo called Alumabestus. That was the brand name, Alumabestus. So um, obviously, with, with this type of ductwork, if there is damage to the ductwork, uh, there is more of a potential for a hazard because the fibers can then become inside the airstream, right? Uh, and supply air to the different rooms. Uh, the diff other type of uh, ductwork is what we call duct insulation wrap. So, this type is where the duct is actually made of sheet metal, okay? And on the outside of the sheet metal, it's wrapped with a corrugated paper that contains asbestos. Anybody know why you <coughs> insulate the duct like this in an attic? Why would you insulate the duct in an attic? Keeps the air conditioning colder. Scott keeps it cold, so thermal, right? Whatever's traveling through the duct. Sure. The attics get really hot, so the same Right, so obviously for temperature, but also for to avoid moisture condensation. Mm -hmm. Right, if you got cold air running through sheet metal, you know, warm attic, what's going to happen on the outside of the sheet metal? You're going to have moisture beads, right? So you've got to insulate that so you don't have moisture drips on top of your ceiling. So that's why they would insulate the ducts in the attic. So nowadays, I mean, a lot of it is the new stuff they're using is a flex duct. It's it's plastic and it's fiberglass <coughs> wire. But in the old days, this is the type of ductwork you would see. Um, other thermal insulation products that could have thermal system insulation products that could have asbestos is what's called a transite vent pipe. So over a, a water heater or over a, a furnace, uh, you will typically see this. It's about a four-inch pipe. It's like a cement pipe, and it, it's it's hard as a rock. I mean, I could take a hammer to that and swing a couple of times, it still won't break. I mean, that's how strong it is. But it's essentially used as an insulator as well, right? Because, for example, you've got a sheet metal exhaust duct here that's going out to the roof, and that sheet metal is going to get hot, right? So you would apply this sleeve, so to speak, over that sheet metal so that you insulate it. So that transite pipe can have a <coughs> um, Register boot insulation. So if you go home and you look in one of your rooms and you see where the supply vent is, right, where the air is going to come out, uh, for cool air or heated air. Behind the drywall where that supply vent is, is a little sheet metal box. And we call that a register boot. Okay, so that sheet metal box is sitting inside the wall cavity, and on top of that there's a little round flange where the duct gets attached and it gets taped. So that sheet metal box, the register boot, many times is wrapped with an asbestos paper, a thin paper, and we call that register boot insulation. And that material can have asbestos as well. Okay? A lot of products, a lot of products, Carol. Yes, you're shaking your head, a lot of products. All right, uh, roofing products, like I said. Um, roofing shingles, now these roofing shingles, probably not. These look like composite roof shingles. Um, but underneath that composite roof shingle, we have paper, we call that felt paper. That felt paper can have asbestos in it. Um, and like I said, the penetration mastic, so this is that black tar mastic adhesive that goes around a roof penetration so that you waterproof it so water doesn't come in when it rains, that material can have asbestos in it. And again, like I said, it's still being sold with asbestos in it. It's still being used today. Okay? Any questions so far? <coughs> no questions. Okay, so this is where it gets really riveting. Regulations. <laughs> riveting. Okay? All right? Be prepared. All right? All right. So I kind of put this in chronology order of kind of, kind of how the origin of, of, of the genesis of the asbestos industry started, the asbestos regulation. So we've got AHERA, which is, stands for the Asbestos Hazard Emergency Response Act. 1986 is when it came out. And the genesis of this regulation is um, late 70s, we find out asbestos causes cancer. Federal government goes, oh shit, we've got a ton of asbestos in public schools. What do we do? We've got kids going to school every day with asbestos in these schools. AHERA comes out. So AHERA required the school districts to 
appoint a person at each school to uh, essentially investigate and test all the schools or survey all the schools to determine what materials contain asbestos. And once they've surveyed the school to determine what contains asbestos, they are supposed to prepare what's called an operations and maintenance plan, an O&M plan. Anybody ever heard of an O&M plan? Okay, so an O&M plan is basically a written document, a living document, that documents what materials contain asbestos and their condition, right? And, you know, you could, you could imagine back then, you know, there were no funds to abate all the asbestos in a school over a summer, so we managed it in place. We would identify what materials had asbestos and what materials were in poor condition, and we would abate those first. And materials that were in good condition, we would leave it, like floor tiles. We would leave the floor tiles in there, but we would manage it in place, such as requirements, such as every three years, somebody has to go back out there and re-inspect, and et cetera, et cetera. So that was AHERA. And AHERA is kind of our godfather regulation that kind of started our industry. It establishes the standard of care how we test, how many samples we're to going to test, how abatement is going to be performed, and whether use of containment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, especially, so a hero was kind of the first. Okay, eighty-six. Uh, not far after, we've got the EPA. Okay, so the EPA, they care about the big picture. They care about disposal. They care about air, land, and water. Right. So they care about where you're going to dispose the asbestos. So their definition of asbestos is any material greater than 1% has to be disposed of as hazardous waste. So that's their definition of asbestos, okay? And EPA is federal, right? Federal, EPA is federal, 1%, keep that in mind, 1%. Anything greater than 1% is asbestos containing material, ACM, you might have heard that acronym, and that's considered hazardous material, has to be properly removed and disposed of. Now, then we move on to Cal OSHA. So Cal OSHA is, OSHA is for work protection, right? So that's an organization that comes up with regulations for work protection. And Cal OSHA is our own, our own state. And, you know, California, we're trendy, right? We had to have our own regulation. We wear skinny jeans. We pay $18 for mac and cheese, you know? We're trendy. We have to come out with our own regulation. We don't go by 1%. We are to go lower than that. So anything less than 1%, they still consider needs to be handled by an abatement company. Still needs to be treated as asbestos. 49 other states, 1%. It can, anything greater than 1%, but other than, under 1%, they don't have to treat it as asbestos. That's why Tony Soprano was throwing all that stuff in the lake, if anybody watched the Sopranos, no? Okay, maybe not. All right, but less than 1%, so we're the only state Okay, that requires that anything under 1% or actually any level of asbestos in the material still has to be handled by licensed, trained workers wearing suits and respirators. So we're a much stricter state here. Okay? So then we've got, so I went federal, we've got Cal OSHA, state level, and now we go with local regulatory agencies. So in the state of California, the EPA has appointed different regulatory agencies to help administer and regulate asbestos-related activity, um, particularly demolitions and renovations, right? And these agencies are called air quality management districts or air pollution control districts, depending on what region you are. So every region has its own. Bay Area AQMD, San Diego APCD, Ventura County APCD. There's all different regions. Where we are is South Coast Air Quality Management District. Anybody here have heard of AQMD? Dealt with AQMD yet? Not yet? That's good, that's good. That's why we're here. We don't wanna deal with them. So, what is the role of AQMD? Well, they regulate any renovation or demolition. They regulate asbestos-related work, okay? And what I mean by that is they require notification. <clears throat> so Andy here, this is Andy McGee with P.W. Stevens. He does abatement work. If Andy's been asked by Carol to go out and remove um, her popcorn ceilings, let's say she's got popcorn ceilings in her house, and she goes, Andy, I, want, I, I like your bid, your price is great. Come out tomorrow. I want you to start scraping. He can't. He's got to send in a notification to AQMD, which is a fee, 
and he has to get approval from them before he starts the job, and that's usually a 10-day notification period. So, um, and that is for any work more than 100 square feet. Has anybody heard the 100 square feet rule before? 10 by 10. 10 by 10, 100 square feet. So I'm, I'm going to go back to the 100 square feet rule because a lot of people misunderstand the 100 square feet rule as well. But the 100 square feet rule, again, applies to notification. So that means if you are doing any renovation um, or demolition that involves more than 100 square feet of material, it needs to be notified to AQMD if it has asbestos, right? So... Um, AQMD also has, again, locally here, South Coast Air Quality Management District has something called Rule 1403. Anybody heard of Rule 1403? Christian has. Okay, my gen gentleman back there has. So Rule 1403 is their own regulation for our region. Okay, and Rule 1403 has been around for a while. It's been around since I think the early 90s, and it's been enforced. And more recently now, it's being enforced more. There are rumors, uh, true rumors actually, that it's actually changing. They're actually gonna update it and make some changes to Rule 1403. But what does Rule 1403 have? Well, Rule 1403 um, requires several things. Um, because South Coast Air Quality Management District is a federal agency under the EPA, so they regulate any material greater than 1%, okay? So if you're doing any removal of any material greater than 1% and involves more than 100 square feet, they have to be notified, okay? And in that notification, there has to be what's called a <coughs> survey, which is a document, a report from a company like Envirotech that we've been out there, we've tested, we've identified what materials contain asbestos. Uh, there's a formal report. So a survey and notification is required over 100 square feet. Um, also in 1403, they have defined the different types of removal procedures that they want the contractor, like Andy, to follow when he does the abatement work. So there's procedure one, two, three, four, and five. So on his notification, if he's going to Carol's house to do the abatement, he's gonna say on his notification, he's gonna remove 800 square feet popcorn ceiling, and he's gonna follow procedure one. Right? And procedure one is your most common removal procedure, which is you set up containment and you use negative air pressure and you HEPA vac and you use those. That's the most common type of removal procedure. So AQMD gets that notification. They see that we know exactly what he's gonna do. Here's your approval number. You can go start on this date, okay? So again, like I said, there's five different removal procedures. Procedure two would be um, glove bags. So if, if a contractor is removing like pipe insulation, so what they use is they use what's called a glove bag. They wrap the pipe with like a, a bag and they stick their hands through the bag and remove it and strip the asbestos. That's called a procedure two removal. A procedure three removal is what we call open wet removal. So let's say uh, we have to do abatement on a roof. Well, we're not gonna use a procedure one, right? We're not gonna build a containment on a roof. We're gonna remove it open wet, meaning two guys are up there, there can one guy spraying it, misting with water, where the other one is removing. That's called a procedure three. And a procedure four is what's called dry removal because um, in all asbestos abatement work, the key component is removal with wet methods, right? That's how you keep the dust levels down. So that's kind of the key element of asbestos abatement. But sometimes you can't use water, right? Maybe you're working in a server room or an electrical room or Maybe you're working in freezing conditions, you can't use water. So you would notify it as a procedure four, right? Then we get to procedure five. Anybody heard of a procedure five? Oh, we've got one hand up there. Okay, all right. So a procedure five, excuse me, is what's defined as an approved, an approved um, alternative, meaning that you wouldn't notify using any of those other procedures. A procedure five is where a consultant, a certified asbestos consultant, comes out, evaluates the, the, the damage or whatnot, and prepares a custom procedure to do the removal. And usually procedure five involves some kind of unanticipated disturbance. So water damage, right? Ceiling collapses. This isn't your standard removal. Why? Because now we've got to deal with, you know, Carol's 
cabinet and her carpet and her clothes and what do we do with all this stuff? So a custom procedure has to be written to, to, to deal with those things. A fire, same thing. What do we do with all this debris? Does it go out as hazardous waste or do we just load it up in a trash can and throw it away, right? Um, vehicle impacts, right? Car goes into the garage after, you know, happy hour one night and, uh, <laughs> you know, we've got to deal with all the stuff in the garage now, right? And clean up all this debris. This is a procedure five worthy type scenario, right? Where somebody's got to come out, an asbestos consultant has to come out, test these materials, identify if they contain asbestos, and prepare this separate report called procedure five, okay? Um, Sometimes this is triggered by plumbing reroutes and plumbing repairs. You know, the plumber comes out and he makes a bunch of cuts in the drywall and it leaves it all dirty and dusty and now we might have some contamination issues we have to deal with and we have to file a procedure five. Okay, any questions so far? Make sense what I'm talking about? No. No? Uh oh. It's crazy. It is crazy. Carol? Yeah, I do have a question because if you have someone living there and you have to wait 10 days to get an approval, uh, that could be an issue. Well, let, let's, let's talk about it. It's a great question. So there is planned abatement, which is your procedures one through four, where you are planning to remove a material that's intact, it's in, condi in good condition. There's really no hazard until you start removing, right? Because you're not creating any dust. So that's a key element, right? That's why asbestos is a hazard. It's when you're actually doing the demolition and removal, you're creating dust, and that's how somebody gets exposed. So if, if a 10-day wait for that is, is really not as an issue. Does that answer your question? She doesn't like my answer. Well, no, because the person that's living there, they want their place fixed up so they can live there. Sure. So I'm talking as a landlord. Right. You're talking about maybe water damage. You have water. Yeah, you, have, you said you got water damage, and the plumber has to cut three or four places to get to the leak. Sure. Now you've got all this going on. I mean, your tenant is not going to want to wait 10 days for somebody to even think about coming in and getting it done. Right. So that's a great example. So if, let's say you had a, a leak in one of your units, and you know you have to cut some drywall to repair the leak or do some kind of a reroute, and you have tested the drywall and you know it contains asbestos, um, if you're doing under 100 square feet, you don't need to notify. And you can go do it tomorrow. But if you're doing more than 100 square feet, that's where the notification requirement and the waiting period Well, the, the, other, the other thing that happens with that is if you've got an active leak, and the only way the plumber can get to the active leak, like we do in a lot of these older buildings, so the water now is just eating the copper pipe. Right. Um, you can't just say, oh, well, we're going to get somebody in to test it because the water is just going all over everywhere. Sure, so sure. Then that, you have to cut it without anything. That is true. That is true. Um, more and more now, plumbers are getting more educated on how to deal and handle asbestos. There are some Cal OSHA regulations that apply that will allow them to, it, it, it's a gray area, but that will allow them to do some removal of asbestos material. It's gotta be a very small quantity. And what I tell plumbers is keep the job clean. You know, if you're gonna cut drywall, keep it clean, you know, clean up after yourself. You know, don't have us show up later, a consultant, and there's dust everywhere, and there's drywall debris all over the place, you know? That, that's where questions get triggered, right? Because a lot of the asbestos issues, are still, so, you know, I mean, I've seen it all. So, you know, I keep the job clean. I, it's the best advice I can give, you know. There's a question back there. What, so what, what's involved in the, the testing itself? How are you supposed to know, you mean, like if you go cut up, cut up, cut open a wall, like it has asbestos, like what's, how do you test that or? Do we have somebody else that comes and tests the drywall? Yeah, so again, you know, a shameless plug. I work for a company called EnviroCheck. We have a team of technicians that are certified through the state that actually go out and do the testing. And we actually, the way that we test is we collect bulk samples. We go out and we take little samples of the popcorn ceiling or we take little samples of the drywall and bring it back to our lab and we identify if there's asbestos there. How long does that normally take? Um, the testing can take no more than an hour. If it's a small job, we get results usually same day or next morning. 
so mm -hmm. relatively quick. But that's because you have your own lab. That's because we have our own lab. Sometimes other companies don't have their own lab, they have to send it out. They do have to send it out, but you know, I mean, um, a lot of labs are pretty fast too, you know, it just depends on the vendor that you're using. But. Yes, ma'am. Assume you have this leak in the wall. I've done through this, is why I'm asking. And you do find that there's tape, the drywall tape has asbestos, and you repair that with place. Does this mean that the association or the owner or the landlord or whoever then has to have the whole house tested or have all of the uh, walls taken down or is it just for this one spot you have once it's fixed everything's okay I mean what is this going to do to the industry when you tell the homeowner that their whole all the walls in their house have to come down because we found a little leak over here right right so the answer is no you don't have to take down all the okay. walls you know just because you have asbestos in the drywall doesn't mean you have to remove it all you know just because you have asbestos in the popcorn ceiling doesn't mean you have to remove the, the whole um, you know, objective of what we're doing here today is we have to protect workers and we want to protect people who are around the work. So if they have to cut drywall here, we just have, and there's asbestos in that drywall, then a proper crew needs to do that. We can't just have any, right. anybody go in there and do that. But you, you don't have to, you don't have to abate, remove those. No, no, you don't. Okay. You don't. Uh, any property in San Diego? Anybody manage any property in San Diego? Okay, so San Diego, again, has their own agency. It's called San Diego APCD, Air Pollution Control District. Uh, they have their own rule called 1206. They're finally kind of <laughs> catching on and they're kind of emulating the 1403 rule. So they've got their own regulation, but there's some slight differences. Um, they also require notification if you're doing more than 100 square feet. Um, but the big difference here is um, this rule only applies to residential buildings or, or any buildings or structures that have four units or more. So a single family home technically you know, is exempt from being notified, but doesn't necessarily mean you can do whatever you want because there's other regulations out there, but you just don't have to notify this agency when you're gonna do any abatement work or demolition work. So that's kind of the big difference with San Diego versus up here, is, is the four units or more. Um, here, here's a lot of common questions I get, and some of the slides after this will, will help answer some of these, but um, if I test one unit and know that there's asbestos, do I have to test another unit in the building? That's a common question I get. So multifamily, um, that, that's kind of where it applies. We tested one apartment. We know there's asbestos in one unit, but we're going to go do work in another unit. Do I need to test that unit? Okay, so that's, that's one of the questions that's out there, and I'll answer that shortly. Uh, second question I get a lot is, hey, can our facility maintenance technician collect samples and just take them to a lab, and then if we know there's asbestos, we'll handle it on our own. Okay, that we get that question a lot as well. And then, if I'm doing under 100 square feet of work, do I still need a test and hire a licensed asbestos contractor? Right, I get that a lot. And that's the kind of what I was going back to earlier, this misunderstanding of this 100 square feet rule. I get a lot of general contractors that think that if it's under 100 square feet, it's, hey, wild, wild west, I can do whatever I want under 100 square feet, and that's just not true, okay? So, Let's, let's look at some other regulations. So this is, some of the next slides are from Cal OSHA, okay? And Cal OSHA, again, is for worker protection. This is section 1529. Mm -hmm. This is the construction standard. Uh, this, this is asbestos in the construction standard, okay? And in Cal OSHA, Title 8, 1529, they have what's called the hazard communication. Have anybody ever heard of that before? Hazard communication. Mm -hmm. So as an employer, you have to properly communicate any potential hazards to your employees. So if you have any workers that are doing work in a building that may involve cutting out drywall, repairing some exterior stucco, cutting out a ceiling for a plumbing repair, that employee is entitled to know of any potential hazards. So we need to know if there's asbestos in that building. Okay, so that's one reason why we have to test, regardless of the 
size of the amount of work we're doing, whether it's over 100 or under 100. There's this rule, communication of hazards, okay? Uh, duties of building facility owners. What does it say? Before work subject to the standards begin, begun, building and facility owners shall determine the presence, location, quantity of asbestos containing material at the work site pursuant to the subject, subsection of the section. So basically owners, uh, facility owners and building owners have a duty. They have to know if there's asbestos in there, especially if they have people working for them in the building. They have to know. There's a duty of the owner to know if there's asbestos. And lastly, um, building or facility owners shall notify the following persons of the presence, location, quantity of asbestos at the worksite in their buildings or facilities. Notification either shall be in writing or shall consist of a personal communication between the owner and the person to whom notification must be given or their authorized representative. So basically what we're saying is the owner's got to tell the following people if there's asbestos. Prospective employer, employers applying or bidding for work. So let's say uh, the cable guy is going to come and do work or an electrician is going to come and do work or a, a plumber is going to come do work in the building. And if the owner knows that they're asbestos, they've got to notify them. They've got to inform them of that. Employees of the owner. So maintenance and facilities personnel of the building need to know if there's asbestos in there. Um, on multi-employer work sites, such as you know, other trades, like I had mentioned, plumbers and electricians and cable guys need to know. And lastly, tenants. That's a drag. Tenants must be notified. Yes, sir? So is there a difference between employees and contractors because they're definitely different than the same because different rights as well. So would that apply to the contractors? So um, clarify what you're saying. Contractor. I have this problem with the past employer where I was trying to bring the asbestos problem to his attention. And <clears throat> since we're, we work as contractors, you know, we have 1099 instead of a Oh, subcontractor, yeah. right. So as a subcontractor, you don't get those same rights that you're talking hmm. about here. That's, that's probably for legal interpretation, but I would think that if you're a sub to a, a, a general, um, he's supposed to let you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's supposed to let you know. I think this is here. On multi-employer work site, that's here. That's you, okay? So let me go back to this question. If I, have, if I test one unit and know there's asbestos, do I have to test another unit in the building? And the general answer to that is yes, you do. Um, and, and it's tricky because it, it just kind of depends. So let me give you a couple of examples and see if this makes sense, okay? Um, anybody work or manage a multi-unit facility, uh, apartments or condo, are they condos, apartments or? Both. Both? Okay, so let's just talk about apartments for now, okay? And apartments, um, let's say you have two or three hundred units in the, in the building. It's built in the, before 1980. And maybe you've tested one unit and it has asbestos, but you're going to go do work in another unit, okay? Same type of work. Same type of work. Let's say, let's just, for the example, let's say it's drywall. You know that the drywall has asbestos in unit A, mm -hmm. but the tenant in unit C is complaining because there's been a leak, and you need to do uh, some removal work of the drywall. Do you need a test in that unit? Well, you already know there's asbestos, right? So um, I would say that you would need a survey, a formal survey, which is a report, if it's a notifiable job. And Andy, jump in here if, if, if you agree or disagree. So if, it's, if, if, if the work that you're gonna do in unit C is under 100 square feet, Andy doesn't have to notify AQMD he can just go do the removal. So you don't necessarily need to test because he doesn't need to have all that paperwork involved of submitting the notification. Because when you submit a notification to AQMD, it requires two documents, the notification and a survey report, which is a formal report from a testing company that shows that there's asbestos in there, signed by a certified asbestos consultant. So if it's under 100 square feet, then he technically doesn't need to notify them. He doesn't technically need to have that survey. Um, so he can technically go do that job without it. Would you do the job without a survey? Or would you want to see some lab work from him? Uh, we'd always like some testing report to show there is asbestos just in case that job, if it's 80 square feet, as been mentioned, we could do it tomorrow. 
but what happens when that 80 square feet you now turns into 250 square feet because the job is expanded on the job? We find more mold. We find you know there's another water leak at the same location. We need to do a bigger job. At that point, we're caught because they can be will say, we need to have a survey for this project. We say, well, we don't have it, and we would stop the job, and then Vin would have to be called out to do a full survey. So it's always beneficial to have a survey before we start. But sometimes time constraints are not going to allow that. If it is a small job, we have no problem going the next day to do it. But keep in mind that if it turns into a larger job, it may stop the job dead without that survey. Yes? So I have a question. So if you test in a unit, say you have a 100 unit building, because it's an easy number. Um, you test in a unit and it tests negative for asbestos. How many more units do you have to test to confirm that that building has negative asbestos? Do you have to test all 100 units? You do not. No. no. To clarify, Ben, we're talking about uh, homeowners such as condos, yes. correct? Okay. Yeah. Not okay. multi-family. So, Let's just clarify that. Yeah. Thank you, Christian, yeah. because that's where it gets really tricky. Mm -hmm. Okay, and here's the reason why. So let, let me talk about apartments first. Okay, okay. apartments, all built at the same time, probably by the same contractor, <coughs> and any modifications to a unit is usually <coughs> approved, usually documented, or anything like that. Right. So you would think that all the drywall in a hundred unit apartment complex is homogeneous, the same. That's a term that we use in the asbestos industry. It's all the same. So if I just test a random amount of units out of the 100, usually at least nine or 15 of them, and they all come back negative, then I can rely on that data according to the EPA. That's the way that we're supposed to test. I can rely on that data and say that all this drywall in this entire complex doesn't have asbestos in it, okay? Now, let's flip the example and let's talk about condos, they're all individually owned. And the problem with applying that sampling strategy is I can't guarantee that that owner never did any modifications in there. So I don't know if all the drywall is homogeneous. So, and it gets expensive, you know? Somebody goes, well, we want to test our entire association. We've got 300 units, <laughs> right? And I'm going, Oh, man, this is complicated, you know, because if I throw you a number, you're going to tell me to pound sand, you know. But that's the difficulty with it is, do we treat each unit as a separate homogeneous unit? Because we don't know. Unless you've got really tight documentation of, you know, in the CCNRs that before anybody does any type of work in their unit, they've got to apply for a, you know, application, et cetera, et cetera. If you've got it really, you feel confident, then maybe we'd give that a shot. But that's kind of the complication of condos versus apartments, you know? So, um, you know, with apartments, you know, a lot of times I urge, um, you know, the, the, the clients to do what's called a facility survey of your most common products uh, that you do repairs to. Drywall, if you have acoustic spray, and stucco. Because it's relatively an easy process, right? We usually need at least nine random samples throughout the entire complex, even if you had 100 units. And um, you would have that survey on file and you would know if there's asbestos or not. Okay? Um, so let me talk a little bit about sampling and how it's done so you understand it a little bit. So earlier I talked about that AHERA regulation about how it set up the standard for testing and standard of care. So there's an AHERA protocol for testing asbestos materials, and it's called the 357 rule. And this applies, this rule applies to what's called surfacing materials. And surfacing materials are defined as any material that's either hand applied or troweled on, or spray applied, okay? And that's when your most common is your acoustic sprays, your drywall, stucco, and plaster. So if there's a thousand square feet or less of that material, we need a minimum of three samples. If there's between 1,000 and 5,000 square feet of material, we need five samples. And if there's between more than 5,000 square feet, you need at least seven samples to determine if the material contains asbestos or doesn't contain asbestos. Now, a lot of times I get calls where then, look, I need you to test the popcorn seal in my house. It's about 1,800 square feet. It's all the same. I never made it. You just need one sample. I don't want to pay for the extra sample. I just need one sample. And there's a problem with that because one, I, that's not following regulation, but you can get a false negative, okay? 
And the example that I use is chocolate chip cookie batter. Imagine this ceiling is sprayed with popcorn ceiling and it's chocolate chip cookie batter. And the chips are your asbestos fibers. So when my technician comes out and takes a sample, they're just taking random samples. They can't see the chips. They're just taking a little piece, maybe about the size of a quarter. But maybe by chance, all they got was batter. But they move three feet over, take another sample, and you get chips in it, right? So that's why the EPA requires that you do multiple samples to verify if a material contains asbestos. Now, if all three or all five or all seven samples come back negative, then you can say that material's negative. But if any single sample comes back positive, then that means that all the material's positive. Do you understand that concept? Because I get a lot of calls where they look at my lab report and they go, Ben, you've taken three samples of the drywall, kitchen, living room, bedroom, only the kitchen's positive. So I guess the living room and bedroom are good. I'm just gonna have my contractor do that. I'm like, no, 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 that's just not what it means. It just means that that sample just didn't detect asbestos in it because there's this randomness of how you collect samples, right? Because of the chocolate chip cookie batter. So any single sample's positive, that means that all that material considered homogeneous, the same, is also positive. Okay, that's an important concept I wanna make sure you guys walk away with, okay? One sample's positive, it means it's all positive, okay? Um, what else? Um, as far as, you know, kind of the services that we provide, you know, or things that you might see out there, there's what's called a laboratory report, and then there's what's called a survey report, okay? A laboratory report is just usually a single page, it's maybe two page document that just tells you, you know, if a material contains asbestos or not. But then it usually gets accompanied with what's called a survey report, which is an actual written document that lists, you know, required information by AQMD and the EPA by, such as which technician did the testing, what's his certification number, what day did he do it, what materials he sampled, what are the list of all the materials sampled, what were positive, what were negative, uh, a sketch of where the samples were taken with marked locations, and then the report has to be signed by a certified asbestos consultant. So this is a formal document, we call that a survey report. It's different from a laboratory report, because every once in a while, I'll get somebody that says, hey, I have a report, and they just furnish me just lab results, and lab results isn't enough. Okay? Especially if you're going to notify AQD, they want to see a survey. Okay, I think that's it. Any, any questions? Christian. Carol, will you go first? Oh, okay. Well, I thought you are collecting these, no? I, we will. Ryan, we help collect those. I'll, I'll start with the first question. So, yes. at the beginning of this year, there's some uh, HOA property managers here. There was a gentleman from. South Coast Air Quality Management District. We came to a CAI luncheon and rattled everybody <coughs> scared. We said, we're coming basically, Eric, what did you say it was? It was, well, it was like uh, Liam Neeson, taken. I'm taken. <laughs> I'm coming after you, I'm gonna find you, I'm gonna find you. So, so what, is, what has happened recently that is kind of taken place in the last almost 12 months or so that is changing because as a restoration contractor we would not have tested properties that are built yesterday 24 12 24 months ago right. there's some new there's some new enforcement that's going could you talk about yeah that? let me talk about that Please, so like I like I said so this rule 1403 has been around since the early 90s and it was a document a lot of these regulations are already in place um, about, I would say about three years ago, um, AQMD, which is located in Diamond Bar, a lot of the, um, the people that were working there had retired and they brought in a bunch, a whole new class of, of regulators and inspectors and they are enforcing more now. And they're committed to enforcing more now. They've hired more people to go out on the street and go to job sites and inspect and, and, and investigate complaints because a lot of the complaints that happen are random um, uh, anonymous calls that call their 800 number, right? So, uh, it, you know, a lot of times it comes from tenants, really, right? That call and say, hey, something's going on next door and then AQB shows up. So 
What's changed is enforcement, all right? There's more people out there enforcing, doing inspections. Uh, the other thing that's changing about AQMD and about Rule 1403 is they are updating the rule. They say, you know what, it needs to be updated. And some of the major changes of their updates are uh, this uh, regardless of date testing. Mm -hmm. That's always been their rule, but they never had it in writing. So we were able to kind of fight it, and you know, there was a lot of slipping through it and being elusive about it. But that's one of their key elements that they are talking about putting in this document about regardless of the date, you need to test. Okay, so that's a big change, right? And one of the other big changes is their sampling. Um, I talked about that 357 rule that applies to surfacing materials, materials that are applied by hand or sprayed applied. That's your acoustic, drywall, plaster, stucco. That makes sense. That concept absolutely makes sense for that. But then there's other, the whole group of materials called miscellaneous materials. These are materials that are manufactured in a factory. Mm -hmm. And usually any asbestos in it is pretty uniform to the product. So back in the day, we were able to just take one sample of a roof shingle or one sample of a floor tile or one sample of an insulation in an attic and determine if it contains asbestos and that was fine. Now they require three. So the cost of testing has increased, you know, because of that rule. We try to fight it. They wanted to actually apply the 357 rule to that, but they are now, you know, negotiating, say, okay, maybe just three, but they're requiring a minimum of three samples on those materials as well. Um, any others I'm missing, Andy? Anything can you think of? Is that statewide or is that nationwide? That's just South Coast. That's just South Coast. You know? Okay, so I have some great questions here. Um, asbestos containing products are not harmful unless the product is disturbed, is that correct? That is true. So when you create dust, is how you get exposed. Do you need to test for every hole you make in drywall or exterior stucco? Hmm. Hmm. That's a good question. Well, um, let's see. I guess the answer would be, depends what you're doing it for, right? Um, and who's doing the work. So if you are having an employee, like a facilities person or a maintenance person, make that hole for you for a repair, you got to test. They got to know. They got to know. Um, if this is just your own house, single family home, and you're, you and your cousin Eddie's gonna go do, do the job tomorrow, this weekend, to your own house, you don't technically need a test, but you know, you might want a test to know so you don't expose yourself, but you know, homeowners are typically exempt if you're doing the work yourself and you don't have employees. It's Cal OSHA that kind of, that's the trigger, a lot of this stuff, it's Cal OSHA, it's employees, it's employee protection, worker protection. Does that answer that question? Yeah, and if you bring in an abatement contractor, then it would be potentially the 100 square feet plus or minus. Correct. Right. Depending on. <coughs> I thought there was a rule about two square feet. We could work on as maintenance people on a, dry, a drywall repair, less than two square feet, and we wouldn't have to report it. Well, again, yeah, you don't have to report it. There's, it's under 100 square feet. You don't have to notify EQMD. Mm -hmm. Again, this now falls under the Cal OSHA umbrella. It's about worker protection, right? So technically, if you're going to do a two square feet cut in known asbestos wall, Cal is going to ask you, do you, have you been trained? Have you been trained to do it? And usually something like that, two square feet, it would be considered uh, O&M work. And I think the minimum uh, training you would need is 16 hours. But I had that course. Yeah. And you're good to go. If an owner of an HOA replaces their drywall and it contains asbestos, how can the HOA protect themselves from future lawsuits, i.e. requirements uh, for architectural approval by HOA? Can they basically force the owners to, or, or even contractors it sounds like, to verify that the material that's going in does not contain asbestos? Well, I mean, if they're putting in new materials, 
highly unlikely that it's going to contain asbestos, especially drywall. You know, it's pretty rare that you're going to find asbestos drywall at Home Depot or wherever to reinstall. Um, but the question is, is how do you... Well, what was my question? Okay. So, I was doing some research on this before I came to the class, and there is comments in a lot of different places that drywall coming in from China does contain asbestos. China. 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 Um, <laughs> because it's cheap and people buy it to make the job less expensive. So I'm saying how does a... We, for instance, have a owner that stripped every wall in his unit, didn't tell us, he just did it, right? He it. And now he's got to replace all this drywall. So how do we Why does he have to replace it? Because he ripped it all out. Yeah, oh, oh all you mean he's got to put in new drywall. I yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so if he goes and gets, we don't know what kind of drywall he's going to put in. Right. What if he puts in drywall that came from China that has asbestos? And as far as we know, our units don't have asbestos. Okay. So how do we protect ourselves as an HOA from future liability? Well, you probably would want to uh, compel him to allow you to test his drywall and once he has it installed. Um, I mean, if it's newer drywall, I, I highly doubt it has asbestos in it. And, you know, you would, you would want to test his unit and verify it doesn't contain asbestos and then you, now you have record of it. So we really have to set up architectural guidelines, first of all, requiring anybody, because People are doing their bathrooms all the time. Sure. And they rip the walls out and put new showers in right. and whatnot. And that's right. not even in our regulations. Right. right. So your CCNRs need to be updated. Yeah. So that's what I say. How do we protect ourselves? CCNRs. Yeah. Yeah. Might want to talk to your lawyer. Here's a good one. What is the sh shelf life of an asbestos survey? Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's a good Ooh. question. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, honestly, I think it. It, it, it should last for the life of the building as long as it's well documented that no changes have been made to the building, you know. Um, although I have heard, you know, depending on the contractor or depending, you know, sometimes they, I, they ask for an updated survey and, you know, because the survey was maybe done in the early 90s. But, you know, in my opinion, I mean, if there was asbestos in 1990 and the building hasn't changed, there's probably asbestos there now. I mean, it isn't, you know. Um, so it really is the level of comfort of the person who's going to do the work for you if they're comfortable with relying on that survey or if they want a new survey or not. Another one. How do you act, how do you actually read the lab reports to translate it to tenants? <laughs> oh, that's a good one. <laughs> um, you know, I think education and awareness is critical you know it, it's 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 where they go online and they talk to their cousin who has a brother and a niece and etc etc that's where it gets bad right I think you have to explain to them that you know if your building has asbestos it's, it's common and you only get exposed if you disturb it mm -hmm. and if <clears throat> dust is created if you leave your walls alone if you leave your ceilings alone you're not going to be exposed to asbestos. So just because you have it in here is, doesn't mean you're being exposed to asbestos at all. So if I can add on to that, well, from an abatement standpoint, what we hear a lot when we're working for property management companies or people that own property and renting it, is they're trying to <coughs> mitigate their risk and liability for, their, for themselves, but and in so doing, may raise their liability because they say, I don't want my tenant to know anything yeah. about it. About Cal OSHA, Section 1529, about owners, the duty of the owner, the building owner. Um, you know, they have to know if there's asbestos and they're supposed to inform tenants mm -hmm. if there's asbestos in it. So, so yes, I mean, uh, there's, asbestos is one of the most regulated substances in the United States. We have so many regulations when it comes to asbestos. And, and mm -hmm. through some regulation, that nuance somewhere, mm -hmm. there, there's going to be risk and liability of that owner if they don't test, you know? And if, if um, you know, the unit, if they're all, their townhomes, <clears throat> if there's, um, you know, the person that was coming out to test it said, okay, well, you're, you're building 1985, you don't have to do it, so you can just, you don't have to do the testing for asbestos. 
I mean, can we counter? Can we tell them to do it anyways? And well, that's kind of what I was talking about. Rule 1403, South Coast Air Quality Management District, they require mm -hmm. testing regardless of the age of the building. Okay. It's a personal thing. That's why I'm, fight. I'm oh, like fighting right. on my landlord. <laughs> gotcha. Do you yes, guys sir. have paper um, copies of what you of your slideshow today or no? Uh, maybe Eric, if you want to email Eric, he can probably provide. Eric is one of our uh, okay. associates back there. He can probably help. We'll have a follow-up email coming out awesome. after this with documentation stuff. So, so what is like asbestos considered harmful or hazardous or is that? <clears throat> when it's disturbed, when dust is created. Well, I know. Like, what what kind of like. What concentration might yeah, cause like you to get sick? Much, much, like, that, that's the thing. We don't know. We don't know. We don't. <laughs> we don't know if it's a one-time exposure. If it takes a million exposures, you know, um, and that's what's so dangerous about asbestos. And the other thing that's dangerous about asbestos is what's called a latency period, which means that if you were exposed to asbestos today, and if you were to develop an asbestos-related disease, you wouldn't know until 20 or 30 years later. Got that coal mine. Yeah. So that's why asbestos is so heavily regulated, because we don't know there's that latency period for the asbestos disease to develop. So what we do know through some history is that individuals who develop asbestos-related diseases are usually those who are being exposed every day, working eight hours a day. Um, but then there's also cases where random, some person just got mesothelioma or asbestosis from maybe a one-time exposure that happened mm -hmm. years ago. You know, so we don't know. Uh, can't thank you enough for coming. Uh, really appreciate you, Vin, uh, taking the time to sure, educate us yes. and show us all the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and um, appreciate everybody's time. Have a great day.